Thank you. I'm really excited. I've been coming, but now I get to contribute a little bit. Also, former Echal marketing guy, uh, ran their global marketing for a time. And personal note, I love motorsports or anything car related. Come talk to me. I'd love to have a conversation. And with that in mind, let's kick off our W6, Wi-Fi 6E conversation. So it's important to note that I work for a wireless tool vendor because we have a very different lens into the world of Wi-Fi. And myself, I can be honest with you when I say there are few people in this room that have forgotten more about Wi-Fi that I currently know. I, I promise you that is not an over-exaggeration. I'm pointing at some of them right now. So what I'm going to try to talk to you guys about is the more practical, non-technical side of things that we see. One benefit I have being in my position, I get to talk to customers literally every single day. I also get to see a ton of Wi-Fi deployments. Obviously, we use our tools to do surveys and design, so I get to see both worlds where customers are trying to create design new networks with the latest tech, and we're also going to see a lot of data on the old networks and new networks after they're deployed. So a lot of this is grounded in reality, and for those of you that were uh, there last night, uh, the humans and the AI both got this right, but what is the first step of any conversation when you start talking about Wi-Fi design or implementing a new network? The requirements. You need to gather the requirements. And the reason that I, I, I say that is Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7, Wi-Fi 8, 9, 10, I think these are really great technologies, but really there are two parts and a lot of complexity to this. And, and the two parts I'd like to think about it is there's the fundamental uh, band, they're using, like 6E introduced the six gigahertz band. All the other Wi-Fi versions, for the most part, will just improve how we utilize the band, bands that we have. So that's the big difference. And meanwhile, the hardware is getting better and introducing a lot of cool technology. And so I think as folks are starting to plan their 6E deployments, one of the first questions I always think about and when we talk about a lot is, do you actually need the six gigahertz spectrum? And I think this is one where you have to be a little bit honest with yourself and also make sure the requirements are well defined. Because if you need the six gigahertz band day one, that's a slightly different design process and a lot more con uh, consideration that you have to put into the design of the six gigahertz network. I'll touch on some of those things that a lot of you have already brought up during your presentations. And if you don't need it, then design for five gigahertz and just make the best effort when it comes down to six. And it really depends on your clients. You can design whatever network you want, but at the end of the day, it won't matter if you don't have the clients that are gonna take advantage of your Wi-Fi network. So I think that's a really important consideration that I wanna make. Now, designing six versus five, this is some real data we collected in a lab, basically. There are a lot of questions around six gigahertz coverage, signal propagation, and again, this is like, we, we have a lot of theoretical stuff, and then we have the reality. The reality is this. The more walls there are, the worse the six gigahertz signal is gonna travel to those walls versus the five gigahertz and the 2.4. In other words, you amplify your problem if you add walls. If you don't have any walls, then there's a different conversation. The other problem is you obviously have low power, standard power. So one solution is you just bump the power up. Well, it turns out you can't always do that in every situation. So you can install a five gigahertz and six gigahertz capable AP, and you might think, you know what, I can get the same coverage. You might not be able to. So I think it's really important when you think about, and we'll talk about rip and replace in a little bit, what that really means. The other thing that I want to point out is, as a wireless tool vendor, and I think a lot of vendors in the space, we're almost doing you guys a disservice in a sense that we're really doubling down on predictive designs. And I can tell you, we have spent a crazy amount of time making our design tools sexy with wall transparencies in 3D and 3D antenna patterns. We have all that. It's awesome. Having said that, there's absolutely no way 
for you to design a network in a vacuum and have it mimic the real world. There just isn't. There's so many variables in the real world, including wall attenuations. And by the way, there is no single wall attenuation on a, on a piece of drywall ever, right? What's behind that drywall? Pipes, studs, things like that. I mean, there's so many examples where taking data points and samples of a couple of walls still barely gets you into the ballpark. So no matter how good you are at designing, ultimately, you're gonna to have to go out in the real world and test, and you're gonna to have to validate that design. Interference, so six gigahertz, no more interference, we don't have to worry about interference at all, right? We're all good, no, not true. So especially, um, you know, here's, here's a live um, you know, capture of a network we had, surveyed tons of interference in this network. Uh, six gigahertz is not a magical solution to interference. You still need to have a good understanding of design, Channel planning, if anything, because of PSC channels, channel plans become even more sophisticated. You gotta really think ahead and how you wanna implement that. Also, if you're in the land of milk and honey, you're in better shape. If you're here, well, you have limited choices when it comes to channel availability. So interference plays a thing, which means you're probably back to narrower channels. So something to think about. Bandwidth and throughput. Ultimately, here's what it comes down to. The, the theoretical stuff is good. Again, it gives you a baseline. Very few uh, environments outside of the lab that I've seen theoretical speeds ever really hit. But more channels means less likely for you to have interference. And one huge benefit of upgrading to Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7, and the, the manufacturers and, and the uh, vendors here will tell you, the hardware is much better than the, the previous generations. Better radios, there's just a bunch of better stuff. Just fundamentally how these things are built, they're better. So you are getting better five gigahertz performance or more options to tune your network for five gigahertz, even if you're not really utilizing six. So here's a survey we did of a school, and you know, well, it looks pretty great. Everything looks pretty good. Some of the areas don't look so good. Um, should we even do a survey of an existing network, right? Is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? It depends. So if you know you're gonna redesign the network from scratch, well, maybe you should invest your time in an AP and a stick survey instead of doing a side survey, which again, if you have to make the trade-off, it's a new network, brand new from scratch, and you know you're gonna have to deploy 6E and design for 6E, maybe AP and a stick is your best investment in time. Generally speaking, of course do a survey. And you know, selfless plug, we tend to inform our models with real world data. So we are able to give you a better predictive design by taking a lot of that real world data and, and figuring out wall attenuations for you and, and doing things that make planning better, saves you time. My, my favorite one, can I rip and replace with 6E hardware? And the answer is, maybe, we don't know. Do you know if your current network is any good? If it sucks, I guarantee your six gigahertz deployment is gonna suck. Nothing is gonna make or solve the issues that you already have if you, if you have bad network design to start with. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I see two types of bad network design. There's network design that fundamentally just wasn't given a lot of thought, so APs are placed in areas where they shouldn't be, too many, too few, um, they're placed in the wrong location, you know, above the duct, they're all sideways, upside down when they shouldn't be, there's all kinds of stuff we see. So that's, that's design that's, you know, a, a definite issue. The other design piece is, it takes a lot to configure and run a network optimally. And with all the new technology coming out, there's more settings, more things to tweak, more things to mess up. So we see a lot of misconfiguration as well as bad design. And I think if you do a survey you, and things don't look so good, or you're getting issues from end users, you gotta figure out which one it is before you make a decision whether or not your existing network is, is good or not. And additionally, if you are just replacing your five gigahertz stuff, and for example, you're in a school where it's more about capacity than coverage, likelihood of you being able to rip and replace much higher, right? Because you're not dealing with large coverage areas, you're actually dealing with small coverage area, and these classrooms are made out of 
you know, brick. And so there's not a lot of interference issue in some of these places. It's actually pretty decent. So, you know, we did a survey. This is a, this is a school right here that we surveyed. And, you know, it's about 75% of the APs you can easily rip and replace. But when you start getting into the auditoriums of this school and other places, well, then that's where you need to do a little bit more consideration and think a little bit more about how this design is going to work. So the, the key takeaway here, guys, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. I wish there was. And having more data and being able to make decisions with good data-driven uh, stuff is, is better. Okay, I'm gonna not spend a ton of time talking about six gigahertz security. I'm just gonna underline all the same stuff you guys have heard. You cannot use six gigahertz without WPA3, which is not a problem in itself, but when you start trying to support legacy devices and mixing things, that becomes a problem. And you can think about how to implement and design your uh, network in a way that minimizes that, but ultimately what you've heard is, hey, don't, don't do anything that uh, requires mixing uh, any of these transition mode issues keep popping up. I don't know when they're gonna be solved, if ever, so just keep that in mind. It's, not, it, it's a little bit more complex, and again, requires a little bit more thought to take care of it. Uh, six gigahertz discovery is a little bit of a pain. Again, depending, and we'll talk about how to deploy and the practical configurations in, in a second, but as you guys know, only certain channels are discoverable by your clients. So every fourth one is how you get your, your cell phone, your, your mobile device is gonna get on the, uh, on the network. So if you have a dedicated six gigahertz SSID only running six gigahertz, you gotta be pretty smart about how you do channel planning so that your client devices know that you have a six gigahertz network, otherwise, it's going to be pretty bad. No one's going to be able to get on. You can do a static plan. You can do a, a combination. You can rely on automated channel planning. You can use 80 megahertz channels exclusively, which pretty much puts you in, you know, make sure that for the most part, you're, you know, you're always seeing that PSC channel. Or you can do a combination where you're running SID with both a five and six, which means if your client device doesn't know the six exists, is gonna be able to get it out, out of the uh, five gigahertz network and be able to sign on then uh, and ultimately um, make it work. Other considerations. So generally speaking, what we see in the real world, again, it's about 20, 25% less coverage when compared to a five gigahertz AP. Uh, that can vary, right? If, again, if you have no walls, it, it's different, but as you start introducing obstacles and attenuation, it's about 20, 25% less. Um, higher throughput per channel, better, you know, better speed, better ability to handle things like 4K, you know, VR, uh, high-tech conference rooms. Um, AFC requirements for external antennas, we kind of just heard that. Basically, if you want to go standard power, you need to check in and make sure that you can do it in that specific location. Anytime you use an external antenna, you need to be able to do that, so you're limited somewhat to how you can deploy and utilize um, six gigahertz in that way. Um, right now, we're still seeing a lot of greenfield, unless your network is you know, in a really, really strange area where there's a lot of other six gigahertz deployments, we're seeing that majority of the interference issues um, are not really there, and that, you know, we typically see in the five gigahertz. So if you have a smart Wi-Fi uh, wi design implementation and everything else, you're, you're gonna be okay. Ch uh, channel availability, I'm not gonna harp on that too much. You guys know it, less here, more in the States. I don't know if that's ever gonna change, hopefully. Uh, practical applications. So one thing we're seeing is people do it to supplement their production network. So primary load, primary network is five gigahertz. And we're seeing some folks try to offload some applications um, onto the six gigahertz. So basically you keep the same SID for simplicity and leverage five gigahertz for out of band discovery. There is only one tiny problem here. It's up to the client to get onto six. So there's some tips and tricks People have tried stuff. There's all kinds of good community knowledge on how to plan and deploy both bands in a way that clients 
end up going to six. Turns out that channel widths play a role. There's a bunch of things that play a role. I'm definitely not an expert on this, but I can tell you this is a problem if you're doing this mixed um, network thing. So basically, it's a really good option. And again, if um, you, know, you have areas where six gigahertz uh, isn't so good, you'll, you'll default to five and everything is gonna be okay. And by the way, like one of the bigger issues with deploying a network isn't necessarily putting up an AP, you gotta move cabling. A lot of times these, the, the cap moving cabling is a big pain in the butt. So in that, in that case, you, know, you might be stuck doing something like this. You can then also just run a dedicated six gigahertz network. If you know you have a, some areas or some applications that will work and you tested them and they work great, deploy it this way. Again, you're gonna need to think about channel discovery. Make sure they use the PSC channels because there's no way for anybody to see the network exists if you're not using those channels. And I think it's a great option. Um, what we're seeing as far as industry adoption, education seems to be the one that is leading the way right now. Uh, I'm sure that there's a lot of other deployments that are coming online, but uh, yeah, that's it. I think I'm just about right on time. You know, big takeaway is, guys, I, I, for me, it's that right now there's still fewer 6C deployments than 5 gigahertz deployments. So a lot of what you see and a lot of what you do is still experimental. You still have to develop the muscle memory for deploying, get that feel for 6 gigahertz, the 6 gigahertz band. So in the meantime, you know, reach out to us. Reach out to other folks that have done it. We're here to help. And if you want to see more from us, see our tools, uh, play around with the Cytos Wave and the micro apps, we're at Zurich 3.4 at 18.15 tonight. Thank you.